watching The Pulse, your weekly guide to global health on Al Jazeera. I'm Shireen El Fecky. Now, in the developing world, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria get a lot of attention. But in low income countries, it's actually cancer, which is a bigger killer. Almost 5 million people die of cancer in the developing world every year, and that figure is set to rise dramatically. Poor countries are woefully unprepared to deal with cancer. So what in the world is being done to help? Here's our report. Seven-year-old Jay has cancer. He's come to hospital in Mumbai to be treated for leukemia. Cancer knows no borders. The disease affects young and old, rich and poor, and it's on the increase around the world. One in nine of the 58 million people dying every year succumbs to cancer. That's more than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. Imagine populations such as Switzerland, Hong Kong, or Honduras were dying from cancer each year. If we are not able to reverse these trends, there will be a 50% increase in these numbers by 2020. Although we know how to prevent, detect, and even cure some cancers, the number of new cases is growing, especially in the developing world. These cancers have many causes, including infections, diet, and critically, smoking. These are causes which could be prevented. In just over a decade, cancer cases in developing countries will double to 10 million. By 2020, it is expected that 60% of all new cancer cases will be in the developing world, which has less than 5% of the resources to deal with the cancer problem. Cancer testing is scarce in developing countries. Daphne Williams lives in Soweto in South Africa. She's survived cervical cancer, a disease that kills nearly half a million women every year. It was a very big blow because at first the doctor said it could have been a tumor, it could be anything else, but he never mentioned the word cancer. I think my cancer, especially mine, could have been detected earlier because I had, I've, until now I've got that fright for doctors. I don't really, I've never been in hospitals before this. Trouble is I'm not the doctor type, you know, of a person running to a doctor with each complaint, you know. I'd rather use a house remedy or, you know, I'm still on the old side of things. But look what I've done to myself. Uh, keeping myself away from doctors, trying this, that, and the other. That I've actually given myself, I would take the blame on myself for having two cancers on one time. But if I had known then what I had known now, I would have gone off go already. I, I blame myself for it because uh, I took too long. I'm not sorry I went to, to hospitals for treatment because I was laying in a hospital once when there was a case that came in that there was nothing the doctors could do for her. She eventually died. Now, if I had waited longer than that, that would have been my story as well. It's pain and all that, but at least you, are, you get saved. You can. Cancer can be cured. Each year, 160,000 children develop cancer like Jay. And like Jay, 80% of them live in the developing world. For most of these children, effective treatment is out of reach. And so one in two will die of their disease. Even India, with its booming economy, is hard pressed to provide cancer treatment to all who need it. If you look at the country as a whole, only 20% of our population has access to the basic rudimentary treatment facilities. So I would estimate that one in five actually get the treatment that they should get. Standard cancer treatment, which is taken for granted in the West, is too expensive for many developing countries. Radiotherapy can, at best, save lives or at least improve the quality of life for cancer patients. But 22 countries in Africa and Asia have no radiotherapy machines at all. 
and newer drugs so effective against cancer in the rich world are simply beyond the reach of the poor. We have more knowledge about cancer than ever before. In order to be effective, though, we need political will and commitment, strategic plans, and resources. Joining me to discuss the growing problem of cancer is Carol Sikora, who's a professor of cancer medicine at Imperial College in London and is the author of a recent book on the global burden of cancer. Carol, the conventional view is that cancer is something which hits populations as they get richer and older. So yes, it's an issue for India, it's an issue for, for China, but for very poor countries in Africa or Asia or Latin America, not a problem. How valid is that? Not strictly true. As populations age, and it's a good thing they do because it means they're getting better medical care, better education, as populations age, the incidence of cancer dramatically increases because cancer is a disease predominantly of people over 50. So the more in the population that live to be over 50, the higher the incidence of cancer. But surely there are behaviors, as we've seen in the film, that young people engage in smoking, for example, uh, diet, uh, inappropriate diet, that also predispose younger populations, even in poorer countries, to cancer later on in life. Absolutely. It's a combination of unhealthy lifestyle, predominantly cigarette smoking, but other factors, as you mentioned, come into it, and age. These are the problems. And of course, you can't do anything about getting old, but you can do something about lifestyle. Now, we saw in the film that uh, there is an issue about a lack of radiotherapy and chemotherapy in poor countries. Now, when it comes to drugs, certainly for infectious diseases, there have been all these international initiatives to make drugs more affordable and accessible to poor populations. What's the situation in cancer medicine? It's more complex because, first of all, it's not a quick fix with cancer. You have to have the drugs or the radiotherapy over a period of time follow up and then often secondary treatments. So it's not as easy as giving someone uh, antibiotics, injections for a, an infectious illness. So it also requires an infrastructure, which requires equipment for radiotherapy, servicing that equipment, and staff that know what they're doing. And these things are lacking right across the world. There are a great, great shortage in the commodity there. Are there any initiatives to make specific chemotherapy drugs more available to uh, poor populations? There have been a few attempts. So Gleevec programs uh, from one of the maker of Gleevec to try and get this drug out there. It's a relatively rare tumor that Gleevec treats very effectively, a type of leukemia. But for the common cancers, it's much more difficult because it's not just the one drug. Often you need a combination, but you also need that infrastructure, that medical infrastructure. I've been associated with a program in Ethiopia, one of the poorest countries of the world, with a very simple medication for breast cancer, tamoxifen, which is generic. The drugs donated freely by the manufacturer. The difficulty is setting up the infrastructure to deliver the drug to the right patient. Now you mentioned Gleevec, and there has been an issue in India, for example, where Gleevec is now, because of a court decision, can now be made by generic manufacturers, thereby lowering the cost. Is that, uh, is, is that, is, is that situation, is the possibility of Indian drug makers producing generic versions of cancer medicines, can that help deal with some of the problem of getting the drugs out to other poor countries? It certainly can. And the whole rules about patents which are strongly defended by the industry because obviously they see themselves losing money if a drug becomes generic and indeed they will lose money so they say well that means we can't do research for new drugs in the future and so you get into this vicious circle of, of how to deal with the situation but when a drug works effectively it seems patently unfair that you price it out of the pocket of people in poorer countries now, Carol, you also mentioned the question of staffing. And in many poor countries, uh, they, they don't produce enough cancer specialists for the population as a whole. And any rare specialist that does graduate from medical school is often snapped up by hospitals in the West. What can be done about this brain drain in cancer? Uh, quite right. There's a huge brain drain in cancer. It's sort of inevitable because to get training, from a poor country, you have to go abroad to a relatively rich country. Because the shortage in supply of skilled staff, people are offered jobs in richer countries and offered much better conditions to work and often don't want to go back. So what we have to do is incentivize people to come, get the training, but also to go back and link centers between rich and poor countries. And there are a few initiatives like that going on. 
So, Carol, if I'm a health minister in a, a country in southern Africa, and 10% or more of my population is HIV positive, and I have donors breathing down my neck that I need to do more on AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, tell me, where is the political pressure, where is the money for me to tackle cancer? One has to find it. People, the, the voter, your, your, your voters, want it. And if you don't tackle cancer now, there's going to be no quick fix in 10 years' time when the number of patients is going to be one and a half times, maybe double, in certain countries. So you're going to have to do strategic planning now. Well, on that note, thank you very much, Carol. Coming up after the break, we look at deadly dinners in Vietnam.